right here. Okay, so we're going to talk about microphones. We've t we started talking about microphones a little bit uh, when we were at the uh, at the uh, recording the other day, right? When we were at the, the stage. So uh, in our chain here, Chris, quiet. Uh, in our chain here, uh, we are down here. And we're going to be converting the analog, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, converting the acoustic energy to uh, electric energy. How do we do that? For the most part, uh, we do it by generating electricity. Does anyone know how electricity is generated? Benjamin Franklin, no. Benjamin Franklin confirmed, I think, that lightning was electricity, or at least that's a myth. Uh, here's a nice simple, oh, here's an even more simple picture. <laughs> here's how you make electricity. You should know this for the rest of your lives. Important. Uh, you take a copper wire and you run it to, uh, you run it through a magnet between the north and south poles of a magnet and you spin that copper wire inside that magnet. It will induce electrons to move back and fourth in this case. When I spin it here, uh, when I spin it so that it's going past the north, an electron moves this way. And when I spin it going past the south, an electron moves this way. And so I've just pushed electrons down a tube. And I have this uh, a tube here like this. And there's X number of electrons that fit into that tube. And when I push it that way, whoop, this electron spits out that side. When this wire comes down here and hits the south, the electron goes the other way. And so now, when I go in the other direction, this electron gets sucked back in and spits this one out. That's electricity. That's all it is. Electrons going back and forth like this. Direct current means it wouldn't go back and forth. It would just go one way and make a loop like this. But this is called this is alternating current, the, the, the demonstration they're showing there. It takes energy to do that. The arm cranking this, when, it, when that copper wire moves past the, uh, the magnets there, there's resistance. It has to overcome that. The energy that's put into that resistance is the same amount of energy that the electrons are carrying back and forth. And when you put, on the other side, a light bulb or a blender or a vacuum cleaner, uh, the energy that was captured when you cranked is now transferred into spinning or lighting up or heating or doing something on the other end. That's how electricity is generated. And there's big ones, big thick wires out there. Uh, that we see overhand, overhead, and they go to nuclear reactors or to, to uh, hydroelectric dams, where they have really huge generators like this, where the magnets are as big as this room and the wires are this thick, and it takes more force than any of us could ever put on it to get the thing started. And that's enough to light all of our refrigerators, or light all of our lights and our, get our refrigerators going and all that. <laughs> Capiche? So, can someone explain to me how electricity is generated? Okay, so what are the two things we need to generate electricity? There's two things. A magnet and a wire. I think it could be more than copper, but copper, do you know? Can it be other metals? Uh, can electricity be generated in any wire, or is it just copper? I, th I think it's any wire. Yeah, yeah, I think aluminum. Yeah, so copper is the one we use the most, because it's, for whatever the reason, the best for conductor. Okay. So you need a magnet and copper wire, and then what do you have to do? You don't even need to create a coil. A coil helps. What do you need to do? You got magnet, copper wire. They need to move around each other somehow. They either either the, the copper wire can spin around the magnet like this. The magnet can spin around the copper wire like this. Okay. If you take that copper wire, Doug, when you're talking a coil, and you have a whole bunch of coils like this, and you spin that magnet around that. So if my hand's moving around this coil of wires, it induces a lot more electricity. A lot more. Okay. So, 
But we could just have that wire like this and spin the magnet around, and that's going to create electricity. Well, the most basic type of microphone, a dynamic microphone, works very much the same way. Okay? A dynamic mo microphone or a moving coil microphone is a microphone that has on it a diaphragm. And that diaphragm is attached to copper wires. And there's this a, a f one end, a positive and a negative on that copper wire. Okay? Those copper wires are inside a magnet. And there's a, a north and a south pole in that magnet. And when you make sound and it comes in and it hits what is called the diaphragm, something you need to know, it hits that diaphragm, it moves this copper wire back and forth in between these magnets, and it causes electricity to flow down these. And you hit it hard, lots of electricity moves up and down. You hit it fast, high frequency, back and forth, the, the electricity goes back and forth very quickly. If you hit it very lightly, the electricity moves back just a little. It, mo it doesn't move as, uh, as much. It doesn't move as much. And you've gone from acoustic energy to electric, and we call this analog. Why do we call this analog? Because if I went boom, like that, really loud there, we would get a spike in the electricity right there. And our waves, they came like this, were tight, and then like that, and then maybe some high frequencies again, would turn into uh, little tight high frequencies, some big low frequencies, little tight high frequencies. Analog. It looks like the real world. It isn't the real world. It's an analog of the real world. We've generated electricity. Moving coil, microphone, diaphragm. You need to know all those things I just said. Questions? Easy? SM58, most of the microphones that most of us can afford are uh, elect, uh, a moving coil. Now, that's changed a little bit. They've figured out how to make the other type of mic cheaper. Okay? Diaphragm right here. Diaphragm. Next type of mic is called a condenser. It works a little bit differently. Uh, it took them a little longer to develop this. A condenser microphone, you have two diaphragms. And you run electricity to them already. You're running electricity through them, positive and a negative. This is called phantom power. If you've ever seen that on a microphone or a, a, a mixer, for condenser microphones, you need to send them phantom power. Okay? That phantom power is sending electricity, and that electricity is jumping across here. They're close enough that they're zapping each other like lightning. A bit of a stretch, but so the electricity is moving through this circuit like this, and you make a sound, and it comes and it hits this diaphragm, and it moves it closer to that diaphragm, and now the electricity can jump easier, and when it pulls back, it's harder for the electricity to jump. So as those plates move closer and further away from each other, the capacitance or capacitor, the, this is a capacitor, the capacitance changes. And another term you'll see for a condenser mic is a capacitor mic, which is actually kind of what it is. Okay? And when those plates move e e close together, the electricity can move through very easily. When the plates are further apart, the electricity doesn't. And you measure the changes in voltage and electricity coming down these wires. Because you don't have to generate electricity and you don't have to move a coil in between these magnets where there's resistance, you're just having these very lightweight things move against each other. Uh, condenser mics are really good for subtle sounds, light sounds. You can, you can just touch it and it'll respond. Respond to all frequencies very well. It's also, because of that, very sensitive. And you drop a capacitor or condenser mic or you blow into it, you can break it because these things are on light springs. So when we talk about the U87 or the M149s we were using the other day, we were using the U87s, the ones that were hanging up above, those are condenser microphones. They picked up pretty much everything in that room. Very subtle. It has two plates, so uh, you can hit either plate. And that's why when you look at the grill. Uh, the ones that were hanging had like two separate sides. Yep, two separate sides to them. Yep. You'll see here when you look at this uh, U87, uh, there's, there's the diaphragm right there. You can see the big old fat diaphragm in there, right? 
And there's, you could also see it from the other direction. If I spun that mic around, it would look the same way. And those, those two diaphragms move closer to each other. Yes? Which is the best mic for singing? Uh, condenser by far. Okay. Yeah. If you're going to wrap, uh, dynamic mics work well. But, but that part of that is because you're having more percussive, explosive sounds. And that punchy sound uh, that you might want might be better in a, in a, in a, a dynamic mic. Yes? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So condenser is going to be better for more percussive. I'm sorry. Dynamic is going to be better for <laughs> percussive sounds. It is inherently percussive. Uh, uh, condenser is going to be better for smoother sounds. You can have like both tracks, like one for smoother sounds and one for percussive sounds, like use both of them. You could. You could. Well, that's sort of what we did, and I'm going to get to ribbon mic here in just a second. Condensers are more accurate. They'll have a lot more high end because uh, a lot more high end because those high frequencies don't have a lot of energy behind them, right? So just t tiny movements. These guys will these guys will hear those tiny movements. So, yeah. Good questions. Any others? Okay, let's get to the last type of microphone: ribbon. A ribbon mic has two magnets here, and a little ribbon in between. With wires coming off it, a positive and a negative. Okay? And uh, when the sound comes, it hits this ribbon, and it's like a little piece of aluminum foil. It moves in between the north and the south pole, and it induces electricity. But this ribbon is very light. The trade-off is it produces very low levels of signal. But it is much more responsive than a dynamic mic. But it is not quite as accurate and responsive as a condenser mic. I would say it's somewhere in between the two. The term we usually end up with ribbon is smooth. Smooth. When we listen to a condenser mic, we will usually say accurate. When we usually do a diamond mi dynamic mic, we will usually say punchy. So ribbon mics are used on things that you want to sound smooth, brass being one of the main ones. If you play brass through a condenser mic, often, especially like those trumps, it'll get a little harsh on the top because the high frequencies are too much, uh, whereas a ribbon will smooth that out a little bit. Things like congas, I would have used them on the timpanis. If I could go back, I would have put the ribbon mics on those timpanis because I think it would have made a nice, cool, smooth kind of sound. Okay. Yeah. They can all, no, they can all take low frequencies. Okay. Still better than the no, they all can take low frequencies pretty well. They will do it differently. So it depends on your envelope. Depends on your envelope, OK? Uh, uh, this, if I have a, let me try to, let me try to route some sounds in here. Uh, if I have, a, dyna if I have a, a dynamic mic and a uh, condenser mic here, if I, uh, make a sound and it comes in, I've got to move that magnet, right? So when that sound starts in the attack phase, the magnets just sit, the things, magnets sit there like you haven't moved them yet, right? It's got friction. It takes a bit to get that, that coil moving in that magnet. And so your dynamic mic will have, it, it will make no sound and then all of a sudden it'll punch up as the mic starts to move. It will, uh, the sound will make its sound and then eventually it will die off. So what happens is the attack and their sustain are cut off. Low level information is cut off. It's not as sensitive to low uh, amplitudes. Low amp. No, the dynamic mic. A condenser mic, very sensitive to low amplitude. And so your attack would look more like this. Your envelope would look more like that. Sorry, it would be the same at the top pretty much. And it would, the sustain would last longer. So you'd hear all that low amplitude sound that the dynamic mic wouldn't have. We know from our synthesis that sometimes we want one and sometimes we want the other, right? Yeah. So dynamic mic, better for percussion sounds. Other things really important for, if you listen to me talk right here and I go, hey, you hear the reverb in the room, right? That reverb is substantially quieter than my voice. If I didn't want to hear the reverb when I was recording someone, I didn't want to hear the sound of the room, what mic would I pick? 
Would I pick dynamic or condenser? Dynamic, why? It wouldn't pick up the quieter sounds. It wouldn't pick up the quieter sounds. So they're, they're different in terms of amplitude. They are also different in terms of frequency. Dynamic mics, uh, high frequencies aren't going to cause them to work as well. So their frequency response on a dynamic versus condenser. Dynamic, if we put in white noise to it, would start to roll off at the high frequencies where a condenser would stay more flat. The high frequencies would be just flat. Are dynamic mics good for interviews? If you are in a room where you don't want anyone else to you, you got a lot of background noise. Say there's cars driving by on the road. There's rustling noise. There's people clicking on their computers or something like that. And you don't want that in the interview. A dynamic mic's great. If you're in a controlled environment, a studio where it's very quiet, and you really want to sound like that person is right there, and it's like a lifelike situation, a condenser is better. And in all these, ribbon is halfway in between, basically. Halfway in between. I'm sort of summing that up a little bit. So if I say I want a high frequency, accurate response of exactly how this room sounds, you're going to say condenser mic. If you're going to say I want to get a nice punchy sound and I don't want to hear that background of the room at all, you're going to say dynamic mic. Yeah. Yeah. And we did at the. So when we were at the uh, at the. Um, Wind Ensemble last week. We put a ribbon mic in amongst the, the woodwinds and brass. Why did I want that? Because I wanted a pretty accurate response, but I wanted to be smooth. I didn't want a lot of harsh trumpet sound. Then we put the condenser mics, the U87s, up above, <clears throat> because there I wanted to get the most accurate sound of the overall orchestra. And then I put dynamic mics on the bass drum and the timpanis because I wanted that percussive sound when they hit. So we put all three right there. If I could go back, the timpanis, uh, I've thought of them as drums. Uh, I've, I've known this in the past, but I was thinking of them as drums when really they aren't. They're more like a bass note. When you hit a timpani, the most important part of it is the dom. They have tons of sustain. They got the attack, but their release is not short at all. They, have, they actually have a pitch, very clear. Yeah, if they wanted that pit, if they wanted the envelope shorter, they'd have to do that, right? So. Yeah, I think it would have been better to have. A little bit more sustain on there, and less of this this cutoff here, and the ribbon would have given me a little more sustain. Sacrificing a touch of the yeah. the punch, but that was okay. Okay. Second thing with mics are the patterns. So we have the types of mics, and we have the patterns. The pattern is how does the mic pick up sound, and there are three. Uh, three, three patterns. They're called polar, pa polar patterns. You'll hear them. And uh, I showed this to you quickly the other day. If we have a microphone, see Victor. Uh, if we have a microphone that picks up sound from all directions, no matter where the sound is coming from, we call that omni. If we have it where we only want sound from the front, we call it cardioid. And if we have sound that we want from the front and the back, the pattern is bi-directional. And why would you use it bi-directional? Ah, so if I had had one of those ribbon mics, and ribbon mics are inherently bi-directional, by the way, because if you remember, I did had a piece of aluminum foil on it where sound can hit it from the front or the back, but it can sit on the side. So ribbon mics are bi-directional by default. Uh, if I put it right in between those two timpanies, it would have picked this timpani and this timpani and nothing else. If uh, I was interviewing Andrew here, if I set up a bi-directional one between us, it would pick up him and me, and it would not pick up Doug and Dave. Does that make sense? So that's a great use for bi-directional. Uh, or when we want to pick up and make that nice stereophonic sound, so what we did when we had in the, the two ribbons that were in the middle of the performance, we had a figure eight that way, and then I had another one in, in, built into it was another figure eight going this way, which allows us to get the left and right, uh, cover the whole area, but pan one left and pan one right. If they were both omni, they would have picked up the exact same thing. They would have picked up the exact same thing. And then left and right wouldn't have sounded any different. 
And if it's cardioid, we would we only gotten a quarter of the sound in one direction. Good questions, right? So if I want a microphone and I want to put it by Chris there and I want to hear everyone in this room, what pattern should I pick? And if I want to just hear me and none of you guys, where should I put the mic? What pattern should I put it in? Right? Cardio. Does that make sense? And if I uh, want to interview Andrew, I would pick. Yeah, okay. And uh, uh, if I was, uh, I wanted to pick up everyone in this room, but I didn't want to hear as much of the room sound as possible. I wanted it only when people talked. I didn't want to hear the reverberation and echoes in the room. What type of mic would I pick? And what pattern would I pick? Dynamic. In which pattern? Omni. Does that make sense? If I'm on stage and I've got someone yelling into the mic and they might drop it and break it, they're being really harsh with the mic, they're blowing on it, and they're going by guitar amps, and I don't want the guitar amp to feed back through the mic, what type of mic and pattern should I use? Dynamic? What pattern? Cardioid. Does that make sense? Hypercardioid, by the way, if you'll see that, just means a narrower cardioid. It is usually dynamic, yes, for that reason. Because dynamic can handle, sorry, one of the things dynamic can handle, as well as being dropped, is yelled at in loud 120, 130 decibel sounds. You take that U87 and you put 130 decibel sound in it, you're going to break the mic. You're going to destroy it. It's too sensitive. Okay. So dynamic mics, man, you can drive a truck over a lot of it. Okay. So loud sounds. They like so loud sounds. They love generating electricity. It's their favorite thing to do. Hit me harder. Okay. All right. So those are the, called the polar pattern charts. You'll see those. I just wanted to jump back up here. Phantom power is the voltage that you have to send to a condenser mic so that that capacitor can work, so those two plates can, can work with each other. Okay. High pass filter. Uh, because, dyne, or because condenser and often ribbon mics are so sensitive, they will pick up the sound coming right up the microphone stand. And if you remember, we had that spider mount shock mount that we had to put the, the one mics on. Uh, we had one of these mics that we put, or these, these uh, mounts that we put the mic in because low frequency sounds would come up the mic stand. I've been in situations where we've had a mic in a room even on a shock mount, and someone shut the door to the room, and because it was wired into the speakers in the control room, it almost blew the speakers out. Because there was some like low one or two hertz sound that the mic picked up, went through the amplifier, went to the speakers, and the speakers go, and we're like, whoa, those are $8,000 speakers. Let me mute that, or let me get a low pass or low cut filter. And most mics will have that low cut filter built right in. If you're recording someone's voice, <coughs> Turn on the high pass or low cut filter. There's no low frequency information, anything below 100 hertz in our voice going on anyway. Cut it out. Okay. If, you're, if you're recording some low bass frequencies, then obviously you need that, right? Okay. But for acoustic guitar, voice, a lot of those things you don't. Is there anybody with the deep voice that you would say not to do that? Uh, well, that? we could go down. We, it would just be a matter of hertz, right? So what? I don't know what 100 hertz, uh, 256 is C, right? So I would have to look at the math on it. I don't think so, yeah. I mean, there's a point, obviously, right? Uh, there might be someone who has a 100 hertz voice out there, but not generally. Yes? This is a little different, but I think it's kind of related. Like, um, you know those, uh, like the sound card, like, for example, the full trade one? Yes. And you put in, like, a guitar or a bass or even, like, when it's using a guitar and a bass. Okay. You're getting a little ahead. You're, you're getting into questions about analog and digital audio that we'll get into. But a guitar has not a microphone on it. It has a pickup on it, which generates an electric energy between the magnet and the string. It actually magnetizes it, right? And it picks up the difference, kind of like a condenser mic in that case. Uh, it runs out electricity. And it's at a different impedance than a microphone level. And we'll talk about those levels in a couple weeks. But that's why you have to plug it in usually a different input or set it to a different setting. Or a lot of them auto sense now and do it. Um, so those polar pattern charts are these things, these drawings that show where the mic is going to pick up from. A uh, couple important things. Uh, proximity effect. 
when you are in cardioid or bidirectional, when you move within six inches of the mic, there's a buildup of low frequencies, often sub-frequencies that get built up. Where do we hear this? We hear this on radio. When the disc jockey's talking, I don't know if you ever heard, uh, uh, who's a, uh, Howard Stern. He, he's got that voice that's really low and deep. Well, a lot of it is that he's right on the right, like this, talking like this, and it's got the deeper sound. It sounds like it's bigger than life, like it's God. And when you, hear, when you go to the uh, movie theaters and like, next, next month the world will end, where will you be? Whatever, in that low, deep voice, a lot of that sound uh, is the proximity effect of when you're in cardioid pattern or bidirectional pattern, there's a buildup of low frequencies when you move really close to the mic. Use it. <laughs> yep, use it to your benefit and also be aware of it when you don't want it, right? Do you want a ton of low vo frequency response on someone's voice when they're singing a song over bass and drums? No. Do you want it when they're on the radio and it's just them? Yes. You can't have all that low frequency information going on if you have bass down there. It's going to mask it and you're going to have mud in your song. Right? So uh, proximity effect. You know, you may want to move that mic pretty close to the snare. So when they hit that snare, it's got the doo sound to it. Okay? Move close to that kick drum so there's this punch on the kick with the, with the low frequencies. Okay? Artificially uh, exaggerating them. Pop filter. If you blow on these mics, don't ever blow on a mic. Uh, if you need to test a mic, you can simply rub or scratch the diaphragm. I recommend not even tapping them at first, especially if you're dealing with a condenser or a ribbon mic. Again, a little tap here, running through a console, amplified onto those $8,000 speakers in the studio that you just got a job at, <laughs> might blow out the speakers. Or someone's ears if they've got headphones on. Let me tell you, that really makes someone mad. So you want to do nice little subtle touches on the mic to see if it's live. And you never want to blow on it because the diaphragm, the mics are not designed to pick up air moving like that. They're designed to pick up compressions and rarefactions, not velocity much. Okay. And so <clears throat> often you'll have to have a pop filter, the best pop filter in the world. Finally, I can give you something you guys can afford. Gentlemen, if you have never bought pantyhose, now's your chance. Pantyhose pot filters. I know you've been waiting for most of your life. <laughs> Uh, uh they, of course, they're not going to show one. Come on. So these are, these are real pop filters. Penny hose. Oh, did I? Oh, I see. Thank you. <laughs> you type pantry hose. Panty hose. Let's see. There it is. I have one of these at home right here. You take a hanger and you put a pair of panty hose on them. Yes. They're okay. The best thing is to not have a pop filter. Again, you know, I have this weird audiophile side to me that thinks it hears things. So I, I swear I can imagine when the pop filter's there. I swear I can hear it. Just like I can hear when there's an EQ on a channel. So I actually try to do my, if I'm recording, I try to do it without a pop filter. That means if I'm performing, I have to know how to not say poo or b or t. Oh, and I have to learn how to say, they went to the store. And I, I move my mouth when I'm recording so that it's not putting a post in there. If you have a good singer that has that kind of control, you can do it. And you will know when you've screwed it up. There's nothing worse than you have a good recording and then someone went poof, and it's a, there's a pop on it. It distorts everything. Yeah, it really stinks. So I would suggest usually putting them. I wouldn't spend much money on a pop filter. If it's 25 bucks, sure, get it. Otherwise, get yourself a pair of pantyhose. Because they can? Because you're too embarrassed to buy your own pantyhose? I don't know. Yeah. These are probably a little bit better. It's remarkably similar to pantyhose, and they all smell the same after you've been singing in them for a while. There's a certain, certain odor to a pop filter. If you're inviting someone over to sing your house, please give them a, a fresh pair of pantyhose, not the one you've been singing into. You'll know that smell. The smell of people's spit on pantyhose for long periods of time. OK. Fun things we're learning here. OK, when you are recording, there are some very important things to be considered. Uh, the most important is you have 
that audio window. Remember that audio window? <coughs> Somewhere we had the audio window. I sure have used up a lot of paper today. Being very wasteful. Uh, we have that audio window and we make a sound and let's say that sound is going something like this. Whatever. Okay? Making some sounds across there. The noise floor is how much sound, how much space, how many decibels do we have between the sound we want and all the other noises that we don't want. And those noises could be hiss from tape, which we don't have to worry about too much anymore. The noise of the microphone, the air conditioning in the background, the people laughing, uh, the bus driving down the street, anything that is on uh, the recording that we don't want. And the amalgamation of all those things, all those sounds that we don't like, creates what's called the noise floor. Okay? And if the noise floor is something like this, we have a pretty good accurate representation of our sound. It's all above the noise floor. But as that noise floor rises, especially if it's white noise, like from an air conditioner, and that noise floor gets here, we now can no longer hear the sounds down here because they're being masked by the noise floor. We're dealing with masking, right? And if your noise floor is really high, you can't do it. Now, the problem is, on the other, other end, you got how many decibels the system can handle. And if you pick up sounds that are too loud, they're going to what? Get squared off here, and what's that going to sound like? What's that? Punchy. No. Well, yeah, no, probably not. Punchy is the... When you cut off a waveform, what happens? Distortion. It's going to distort it, right? Clipping. Distortion. Square wave, right? What? Hacked it off. So what we have is this relationship between the top, the maximum point that the system can handle before it starts to distort or clip, the system gets overloaded, and the floor below it. And that is all the space we have to deal with. We have to manage that. And I was dealing with it at the recording the other day because guess what? They're playing, let's say the noise floor was here, down low. It was nice, it was pretty quiet in the room. And they're playing this pretty little flute sound. <whistles> Bass drum! <laughs> right? <laughs> And I'm trying to, I'm having to turn those mics down and down and down, but I'm worried about the, the, the eventually, you're not even going to hear the flute, you're just going to hear the hiss of the air conditioning and all that stuff in the room, right? I was having a lot of problems with the dynamic range in that orchestra because it was so extreme with that bass drum. This is literally what was happening. Okay? How, I had to keep turning them down to not distort, and then I was, the noise floor was coming up relative to the sound I want. And this relationship between the sound you want, that blue and the red, is called the signal to noise ratio. You want the highest signal-to-noise ratio you can have without distortion. What does that mean? When you record your sounds, when you mix your sounds, you want it to be as loud as possible before it distorts. That's the rule of thumb there. That's why I see they put the system in the tent to have it so quiet so they don't have to deal with all the... Like yeah, so you also want to control your environment, right? And there's a couple ways that we've learned to control our environment. One is pick a quiet environment. Two. Move the microphone closer to the source. That's the number one thing, right? You put the bass drum in a separate room. But what that actually would have been handy. That's, and that's what you would do in a studio. You would put up gobos, and you would try to isolate the drum set, because the drum set is a pain. Right? Okay. So distance is your number one friend. The closer you move the mic to the source, and the further away it is from anything else, it's going to only pick up that source. Every time you double the distance, it's going to be quarter as loud, right? So if I'm four feet from this wall and only two feet from my mouth, that wall, what's coming from that wall is a fourth as loud. Right? So distance is your number one friend. Controlling the environment, is, uh, then you have your mic selection. right? You have your mic pattern and you have the type of mic. And those are your four main controls you have over your signal to noise ratio when you're making a recording. All good? Questions? I told you I'd be done in a half hour-ish. <laughs>